yes, Fallout Boy, multi platinum selling rock and roll band Fallout Boy. What advice would you give new rock bands starting out today? I think that um, more than anything, like you can you can learn like the intelligible. Let's set the stage a little bit, shall we? The year in question was 2008, and after about three years of unexpected mainstream rock stardom, hundreds of thousands of record sales, tabloid celebrity status, marrying and impregnating pop stars, appearances on schlocky teen drama shows like One Tree Hill and headlining arena shows, spearheaded by the success of top 10 emo-tinged radio smash hits like Sugar We're Going Down, Dance Dance and Thanks for the Memories, Fall Out Boy released their fourth official full-length record entitled Fully A Du, a French term meaning the shared madness of two on December the 10th of 2008. Fully A Du was somewhat of a musical departure for Fall Out Boy, their most experimental and creatively diverse record yet, which pushed the boundaries of not only Fall Out Boy's sound, but also the sound of emo and pop punk in general, to new heights. It was also arguably one of their best records, at least musically speaking, featuring some of the most interesting musical compositions from singer Patrick Stump, as well as some of the most tasteful and poignant lyrics from emo legend and band frontman slash bass player screamer Pete Wentz. Now, Fall Out Boy were still a very relevant mainstream band at the time, and obviously had quite the seemingly infinite budget for the record. They worked with with people like Pharrell Williams, Lil Wayne is on a track, even freaking Elvis Costello is on this thing. Despite the fact that the album sold 149,000 copies first week, let me repeat that, 149,000 copies in its first week, and it also debuted at number 8 on the Billboard 200, the album overall didn't sell quite as well as their previous two records. The album's lead single, I Don't Care, didn't become quite as big as their previous singles, and there was this perceived notion that fans generally weren't as into the album because of the change of sound, the experimentation. However, nowadays in 2021, almost 2022, Foley has since surpassed gold status and is now beloved by fans who often refer to it as one of Fall Out Boy's best records, if if not their best. A Pinkerton-esque, cult-like, black sheep turned fan favorite record type trajectory, if you will. Regardless, after the slight weirdness in the air following the release of Foley, paired with the fact that the band had been touring for like seven years straight and were exhausted and felt that Fall Out Boy as an entity had become somewhat tired and bloated, at the end of the year 2009, Fall Out Boy announced that they would be temporarily laying the band to rest and would be going on hiatus indefinitely. Pete Wentz stated that the band needed to, quote, decompress, although they presumably always intended to get the band back together at some point. Now, during this hiatus, the four Fall Out Boy members continued doing music in three separate new projects, Patrick embarking on a one-man solo career, Pete Wentz teaming up with promising young pop singer B.B. Rexa to start the electronic-tinged dance hall act Black Cards, and Joe and Andy teaming up with Every Time I Die singer Keith Buckley, as well as Scott Ian, to form the hard rock supergroup The Damned Things. Ironically, Pete's project Black Cards ended up kind of being the least popular of the three projects, weirdly enough. That's how fate would have it, isn't that strange? And also Joe and Andy's band The Damned Things, really cool band. I like The Damned Things. Their first album, Ironic Class, I think it's called, I like that a lot. I intend to make a video about them one day. Very cool stuff. And then we have... Patrick's solo project. Let's get into it. So most Fall Out Boy fans at the time 
including myself, had very high hopes for Patrick's solo work as Patrick was seen as sort of the musical genius behind Fall Out Boy's songs, being that he was the one who essentially composed all of the music and wrote all of the vocal melodies and all that. Basically, everything besides the lyrics when it came to Fall Out Boy's songs were pretty much the brainchild of Patrick Stump, you know? Patrick put out his first solo effort, a six-song EP entitled Truant Wave on February 22nd of 2011, which he released on his own. Truant Wave is definitely a whole lot different from what you'd expect from, like, say, Fall Out Boy at the time. It's certainly not emo. It's certainly not pop punk. It's way more of an R&B alternative synth pop type direction. But it does have what I would consider to be great songs. <laughs> <laughs> the True and Wave EP, if you ask me, it's bumping. And in some ways, I could see the sound on this EP being the next logical direction that Fall Out Boy may have gone sound-wise following Foley Adieu had they not gone on hiatus, maybe? Albeit with a little bit more distorted guitar and broken-hearted Pete Wentz patented lyrics, you know what I'm saying? In fact, I personally think that, like, the song Love, Selfish Love, for example, I think that's one of Patrick's best songs in his whole repertoire, Fall Out Boy or not. Not. On top of that, Porcelain is a great track, Cute Girls is a cool one, As Long As I Know I'm Getting Paid is really fun. I like the Truant Wave EP. Good songs. Now, Patrick had explained, however, that the Truant Wave EP was more of a collection of random songs he had lying around, as opposed to a full, fleshed-out, finished project. And the big kahuna of his solo career, as it were, which he was hyping up a lot at the time, was a full-length record, an upcoming full-length record called Soul Punk. Now, Soul Punk was finally released on October 18th of 2011 through Island Records, who Fall Out Boy were also signed to. And in Fall Out Boy, you know, you really kind of focused on the music and Pete, mm -hmm. you know, really focused on the lyrics. And this time you did both. Was that a scary thing to kind of venture into the lyric it, it atmosphere? Was a, it was a new challenge because I used to write lyrics a lot. Um, and over the years of writing with Pete, uh, my lyrics started to sound like his a lot. You know, I mean, whatever, that's just what I dealt with. So, and I kind of lost my voice a little bit, so I kind of had to find me again or change, you know, kind of find, you know, kind of create something new. So I ended up, you know, Pete had a, such a distinct, has such a distinctly um, word-driven kind of, you know, he, he loves, he, he's, he has this passion for words and he, he'll, he'll send you these very long couplets, <laughs> these very, you know, wordy couplets. And so, I, I decided to, again, to, to do something different. I, I tried to be really succinct and really brief and really, um, you know, I, I used very, very small words, um, just, just as a different thing, you know, to try something different. The whole, the whole, the whole idea of the whole thing is to be, is to, to not, is, is to do stuff that I can't do with Fall Out Boy, so. So, Soul Punk. Despite Soul Punk being backed by a big major label promotional campaign, as well as actually receiving really, really good reviews from critics, really positive reviews, the album only sold, get this, 9,000 copies in its first week. Spawned no big hits, and ultimately the album... In the eyes of the mainstream world, it kind of flopped, and it was considered somewhat of a commercial failure at the time. Now, obviously, there's a lot to be said about how this was uh, right smack dab in the era in which the music industry was in a huge limbo, less people were buying CDs than ever, and Spotify and other big streaming services weren't really prominent yet, you know? The music industry was still figuring out how to handle this whole streaming and downloading thing. So that definitely comes into play when looking at Patrick Stump's first week sales of 9,000 copies. But also, look at it this way. Just a few years earlier, like I was saying, Fall Out Boy's Foley I Do record was kind of looked at as a big disappointment sales-wise, right? But 
Might I remind you that that fucking thing sold 149,000 copies first week. Like, regardless of the changing of the music industry and all that jazz, that mu going from 149,000 first week to 9,000 first week, that must have been a huge, huge blow to Patrick's overall morale, you know? That must have been a shock for him, you know? And, might I add, with a musical sound on Soul Punk that was way more comparable to straight up Michael Jackson rather than like newfound glory paired with Patrick tackling decidedly very adult topics lyrically on the album like adultery on the eye and lie alcoholism on run dry capitalism and like gambling on greed and loving your city on this city once again despite the positive reviews from critics there was a pretty strong pushback from a lot of fall out boy fans at the time who might have been a little bit younger and didn't really connect with the R&B sound and the uh, seemingly adult uh, lyrical themes and, you know, didn't care much for Patrick's uh, new sound and wanted the old, you know, teenage emo Patrick back. Soul Punk was definitely not the album that most fans expected, and in a lot of cases, not an album that a lot of them even wanted. In a review of Soul Punk from Rock Sound Magazine, the author said, quote, it's good, really good, but only if you want it to be. I feel like I'm gonna explode any moment, I'm ready to blow. I can't stand it, I get so worried. I get so now, while in some ways this looked like humble beginnings uh, in which a, uh, you know, promising solo journey may blossom out of, and Patrick really did seem very excited about what he brought to the table on Soul Punk musically, once 2012 rolled around, things in the world of Patrick Stump went quiet. For a little bit, there were no, uh, you know, no tour dates, no updates. It was just kind of radio silence for a little bit until... And... Strap in, guys, because this is the moment you've all been waiting for. On February 29th of 2012, to be exact, Patrick posted a blog post, I believe, onto his Tumblr account at the time, but it also got, you know, circled around and posted by other publications like Alt Press, for example. Um, and, and this blog post was entitled, We Liked You Better Fat, Confessions of a Pariah. It's very sad, um, and yeah, I don't know. It's very, uh, let's get into it. It's very, it's, it's, it's very human, I'll say. It puts Patrick, it humanizes him a lot and expresses a lot of what he was going through, uh, during the time of his solo career. Let's just, let's just jump into it and then I'll say, you know, what I think about it after. But real quick, friends, before we get into Patrick's crazy blog post, I just want to give a quick thank you and shout out to today's sponsor. That's right, the sponsor of today's video, Ride or Die Clothing. That's right, Ride or Die Clothing. Now, the holiday season is upon us. It is certainly time to bundle up. It is certainly time to give gifts to your friends and loved ones. And what better way? way to, to, you know, ring in the holiday spirit and give your friends a little bit of that emo and a little bit of that neon flair than with some of these awesome clothes that you can get from my friends over at Ride or Die Clothing. Check out these this new line of clothes. They're awesome. You'll be looking like you're hopping off the tour bus with M Martin Johnson and Gabe Supporta by your side in 2007. You just got signed to Decadence Records. You're hanging out with Pete Wentz. You're rocking ride or die clothing you got to get it for yourself and for your friends this holiday season so you can check out my friends over at ride or die clothing anywhere on social media ride or die brand is the handle on instagram and twitter and all that good stuff ride or die brand go give them a follow tell them the cozy representative sent you or if you want to purchase some of these dope threads which you absolutely should once again holiday season uh ride or die clothing.net is the place place to go, riderdieclothing.net. Also, if you go on to riderdieclothing.net, there are a couple uh, super special, exclusive, cozy representative 
uh, shirt designs on there that uh, me and Ride or Die did as a collab, and you can get those too um, if you want to support the both of us. So thank you very much for Ride or Die for sponsoring today's video. Uh, and with that, onwards with Patrick's blog post. There's this really nice piece at underthegunreview.net by Jacob Tender that a friend forwarded me today. It's about how important Fall Out Boy's album from Under the Cork Tree was to him. After reading it, though, nostalgic and well-written as it was, I really found myself more depressed than anything. It's a complicated feeling, uh, one that I've been incapable of explaining to anyone and have them fully understand. In spite of this, though, I, was, I suppose I will give it the old I didn't go to college try. Tender had one line that really hit home for me. I related to it in terms of my feeling towards other artists, but I also winced at the profound implications it touched on in my own professional life. Quote, I didn't like those pretentious assholes who didn't like anything after Take This to Your Grave. I now recognize that I'm one of those assholes, but I still fume when some of my favorite records are so easily discredited by ignorant semi-listeners. End quote. <laughs> the reality is that for a certain number of people, all I've ever done, all I ever will do, and all I ever had the capacity to do worth a damn was a record I began recording when I was 18 years old. That I can live with. That's fine and fair. I have those records in my collection that seem to stand out far above the rest of my favorite artists' catalogs, and especially for artists in whom I only have a passing interest. I suppose there's nothing wrong in thinking I'm at a point in my life where it seems I'll never catch up. If anyone's going to appreciate the work I'm making, it won't be long until after I'm done doing it. Again, this is fine. I'm insanely lucky to even imagine anyone ever appreciating anything I ever do, let alone in real time. Countless artists far better than I have only achieved posthumous acclaim. If I am to be obscure and financially unsuccessful, there's nothing disheartening in that. The thing that's more disheartening is the constant stream of insults I'm enduring in my financially unsuccessful obscurity. Fall Out Boy's last album, Foley Adieu, was our most critically panned and audiences openly hated it. It was also our poorest selling major label album, even if one adjusts for the changing music economy. Now, that's not to say it didn't have its fans, but at no other point in my professional career Career was I nearly booed off stages for playing new songs. Touring on Foley was like being the last act at the vaudeville show. We were rotten vegetable targets in clandestine hoodies. That experience really took the wind out of the band's sails. It stopped being fun. I suppose I'm just not that thick skinned, so perhaps it was even more ill-advised when I went out and did something I've always wanted to do. Make my album and have it be released by Island Records, my solo record Soul Punk. I coincidentally happened to achieve another goal, which was to lose the weight I'd been carrying around since a month-long drinking binge after a bad breakup. Those accomplishments were happy things. Living in the moments of achieving them were perhaps among the happiest in my life. So, when I went out into the world to show off the self I felt like I was happiest and most comfortable being, I suppose I knew there would be haters, I loathe the clumsy and insufficient word, but it seems the most universal, the elitists that would always prove impossible to please. I had always been prepared for haters because there's never been a moment since I graduated high school where I haven't been the guy in that emo band. First said emo band was dismissed as third-rate pop punk played by hardcore kids, a pale imitation of Saves the Day. Then we were swept up in the emo backlash. I really didn't know we were an emo band. That's not what the word meant a decade ago. To this day, my favorite writer at Cracked.com will occasionally take swipes at my band as one of the worst things to come out of the 2000s. We were an albeit funny running joke on an episode of Children's Hospital. Those examples of haters were people who never liked me, or at least never liked my music, and by all rights never really should. Such is the way of things. Different strokes for different folks, as it were. What I wasn't prepared for was the fervor of hate from people who were ostensibly my own support or at least supporters of something I had been a part of. The barrage of, we liked you better fat, 
the threatening letters to my home, the kids that paid for tickets to my solo shows to tell me how much I sucked without Fall Out Boy. That wasn't something I suppose I was or ever will be ready for. That's dedication. That's real palpable anger. Added into the economic risk I had taken, in short, I blew my nest egg on that record and touring in support of it, the hate really crushed me. The standard response to any compliments I could possibly have about my position in life seemed to be, you poor Poor, sad multimillionaire. I feel so sorry for you. Quite right, I still have access to enough money to live on in order to avoid bankruptcy for at least a few years as long as I stick to my budget, but money really isn't everything and it never was. Perhaps those are the words of a privileged man who doesn't really know what poverty really feels like. Again, that would be a fair rebuttal. I wasn't raised rich, but lower middle class upbringing in early 90s Midwest US of A is still a far way from the breadline. Still, there's no amount of money in the world that makes one feel content with having no self-respect. There's no amount of money that makes you feel better when people think of you as a joke, or a hack, or a failure, or ugly, or stupid, or morally empty. This, of course, isn't Tender's fault. He never said anything negative and indeed only said great and supportive things. I guess I'm just angry because he illuminates why I'm a 27-year-old has-been. I'm a touring artist and I feel I've become incapable of touring anymore with any act. Whether I were to go out as a solo artist or do some Fall Out Boy reunion, nope, still never broke up, or start a new band, there will still be 10-20% to 20 of the audience there to tell me how shitty whatever it is I'm doing and how much better the thing I used to do was. Not only that, but that 10-20% to 20 combined with whatever notoriety Fall Out Boy used to have prevents me from having the ability to start over from the bottom again. I can't even go back to playing basement shows. As the saying goes, I couldn't get booked at the opening of a letter. It's as though I've received some big cosmic sign that says I should disappear. So I've kind of disappeared. I know a lot of you have wondered where I've been. I'm sure others of you are disappointed to hear I'm still kicking around somewhere. Kidding, sort of. But the truth is, wherever and whoever I am, whoever I am, whenever I release whatever I release next, whoever said recording is recorded with, I will never be the kid from Take This To Your Grave again. And I'm deeply sorry that I can't be. I truly am. No irony. No sarcasm. I hate waking up in the morning knowing I'm disappointing so many people. I hate feeling like the awkward adult husk of a discarded, once cute child actor. I'm debating going back to school and learning a proper trade. It's tempting to say that I won't ever play or tour or record again, but I think that's probably just pent up, poor me, emotional pessimism pessimism talking. I suppose I can be excused of that though, right? I am the guy from that emo band after all. I've managed to cobble together some work, I've been moonlighting as a professional songwriter slash producer for hire, and I've been doing a bit of acting here and there. I have no interest, and evidently that sentiment is reciprocated, in performing music publicly anytime soon, but as I've said, I'm sure that will happen when it happens. I've been debating releasing the unfinished follow-up to Soul Punk, we'll see what happens there, Still no word on Fall Out Boy. I know Joe is working on his new record and Pete's mixtape just came out, so I don't expect anything on that front in the near future. I, as always, would be super psyched to do the band again, though. I've been watching a lot of Downton Abbey and I've finally caught up on The Office. Friends have been turning me on to all the records I've been too busy to listen to over the past couple years. I do suggest reading Tender's column if it sounds interesting to you. He's a great writer and it's a fun, relatable little story regardless of who the band is within. In it. Film adaptations of Nick Hornby novels should be proof of that. So, goddamn, this freaking blog post, man. I don't think I've ever really before or since heard Patrick publicly talk this candidly and this personally about his struggles involving the ups and downs of his professional music career. At the time of me making this video, it is December of 2021, and in two months it will have been 10 whole years since this blog was posted. In that time, Fall Out Boy returned in the spring of 2013, and their comeback album, 2013 Save Rock and Roll, went number one on the charts and hit platinum status with sales of over a million copies sold. Their 2015 album, American Beauty, American Psycho, debuted on the charts at number one and hit platinum status with sales of over a million copies sold. 
Their 2018 album Mania debuted on the charts at number one and was nominated for a Grammy for Best Rock Album of that year. However, total sales on that one have stalled at around 200,000 copies and it has yet to reach gold status. In 2019, Fall Out Boy released their second greatest hits compilation, which featured songs like My Songs Know What You Did in the Dark, Light Em Up, a single which has gone six times platinum, Alone Together, which is platinum, Centuries, which is four times platinum, Immortals, which is platinum, Irresistible, which is platinum, and Uma Thurman, which is two times platinum. On top of that, upon returning from their hiatus, Fall Out Boy all but completely reinvented themselves musically, sonically, and aesthetically, existing since Save Rock and Roll as somewhat of a futuristic, experimental, contemporary pop band, choosing to rarely rely on nostalgia, if at all, creating a second wave of relevance and a new idea identity for themselves without having to play into the nostalgic emo band card, becoming a multi-generational phenomenon in the process. Patrick Stump was able to find great, great success with his band without having to try to quote unquote, be the kid from Take This To Your Grave again. Now, I have a tendency to compare bands' trajectories to Weezer's career pretty often in my videos. Hell, I even made a Pinkerton reference earlier in this video, but I want to reflect on that again. Obviously, Patrick was feeling very dejected when he wrote that 2012 blog post. He felt defeated, he bared his true soul to the world on Soul Punk and on Folie Adieu for that matter, and in his eyes, he was shunned and discouraged from doing so in the form of a barrage of hate from fans who seemingly only wanted him to exist exist as a caricature of his younger self in order for them to like him or to take him seriously. He felt like a washed up joke or even a fraud. He decided to release this blog and go away for a while. It was the same thing that happened to Rivers Cuomo after the ultra personal and way less commercial Pinkerton was released in 1996 to a not so great response. He went into hiding and felt ashamed of himself, felt as if his audience wanted him to be something that he wasn't. He felt like Weezer was reduced to being forever perceived as this goofy joke nerd band with the music video with the Fonz in it, much like how Patrick felt that he or Fall Out Boy may never live down being that emo band. Both artists, Patrick and Rivers in that moment, had somewhat of a breakdown and neither of them returned to the forefront the same person that they once were. In realizing these parallels, it made me realize how similar Fall Out Boy in the 2010s were to Weezer in the 2000s, not necessarily in a musical sense, but in terms of their careers. Both artists, Rivers and Patrick, returned to the spotlight and seemed more inclined to rest on their pop laurels musically and emphasize their desire to ultimately craft the perfect pop song. And before I begin to sound like a jaded old head who only likes the older music, I want to say this very clearly now. I'm a big fan of Weezer's albums in the 2000s, and I'm even a big fan of Fall Out Boy's post-hiatus work. It's good, even great music for what it is, and both bands found ways to reinvent themselves and evolve in a way that seemingly works for them, musically and personally, and, not to mention, to great great success in the mainstream music world, propelling both of their bands to multi-generational phenomenon status. And I always enjoy hearing Rivers Cuomo's evolution of his zany pop rock creations over the years, and I appreciate Fall Out Boy's stab at creating futuristic, experimental, arena pop rock music on their recent albums. However, I have to admit that a lot of times, both Weezer and Fall Out Boy's more recent music can often feel a bit more faceless, a bit less unique, and in some ways less special, as it once did. Sometimes it almost feels like Rivers and Patrick are writing for someone else's mainstream pop songwriting project when it comes to their bands, as opposed to tapping more into that personal unique touch which created the magical, one-of-a-kind feelings on their older classic albums. And again, that's not inherently a bad thing. It is what it is. I love me a good pop song. The work of these artists still has merit to this day. I don't want to make it sound like uh, 
I think that it doesn't, because they got seemingly more commercial. But what I am saying is it always makes me wonder how the trajectory of artists like Patrick Stump or Rivers Cuomo would have panned out had the world not been so unkind to them during the times in which they decided to be at their most artistically vulnerable, original, and transparent, and in a lot of ways truly magical. I also think it's very important to mention that when it comes to these two artists, a lot of the pushback and negative responses to both Pinkerton and Folia Du might have been a little bit more in their heads and more of a metaphorical sense as opposed to actual reality. Pinkerton did get a few bad reviews and it didn't sell as much as their previous record or provide a big MTV hit, but I know from talking to people that real hardcore Weezer fans at the time loved it. It just wasn't for the radio crowd. Fully Adieu, same thing. I was a huge Fall Out Boy fan when that record came out. I was very <laughs> involved in their online fandom. Virtually no one who was a big Fall Out Boy fan at the time hated that album, as far as I can remember. Again, it just wasn't for the radio crowd at the time. While I do find it very hard to believe that people were actually, like, actually showing up to Fall Out Boy shows during the Foley era just to boo, I, I don't think that that actually happened, but I do think that maybe it was happening metaphorically to Patrick in his own mind. It's like once an artist hits mainstream success and has platinum singles and big radio hits, maybe it becomes more difficult for them to see their art as truly valid unless it keeps receiving the same level of accolades. And that could explain why artists like Patrick and Rivers' music comes off feeling less personal, more universal, and uh, more written for mass audiences later in their careers. And again, not that that's a bad thing, but it makes me wonder what kind of music these types of artists would have made in their lives had the pressures of major label mainstream rock stardom not become a factor for them, or if they didn't feel outcasted by the music industry, uh, you know, in a time when they truly tried to be themselves and be their most vulnerable. I don't know. I could go on and on about this, but I think Patrick's 2012 blog post puts a lot of things into perspective about the true realities about what artistic people go through once they start making money from their art and have to compete on a mainstream level, uh, even if they didn't necessarily ask for it, and the life-altering ups and downs that come with that kind of pressure. It's really interesting to me. I have been the Cozy Representative, and thank you all for watching this video and for the support. Please subscribe and hit the like button if you feel so inclined. Big thanks to anyone who supports me on Patreon. All of you are the real MVPs who truly help make the magic happen. Follow the link in the description for bonus content and more, or if you just want to further support the channel. And once again, big thanks to anybody who supports this channel in any way. I love you all, and I have many, many big things planned for 2022. Happy holidays, everyone. Much love.